Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon to all the participants and all the attendees that are uh, following the lecture from Gathertown. Um, uh, we want to thank you for being here, for following uh, the afternoon uh, session of the conference, uh, which for you might also be the morning session uh, of the conference. Uh, and uh, we actually uh, want to welcome Jessica and Tim for being here with us today and presenting their work. Welcome, guys. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Yeah, it's brilliant to be here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just introduce them first uh, and then give a little description of their art installation. And then they're going to walk us through uh, their uh, art installation, their ideas. Uh, it's gonna, their lecture is going to last around 35, 40 minutes. Uh, and then we can open the floor for questions uh, from you guys. Uh, so get ready. Once again, a similar format. Uh, if you are going to be in the lecture hall now uh, and you're probably sitting on a chair and once you have a question, please do copy paste it in the chat that is um, at the bottom left of your screen and that way we're going to make sure uh, to report the questions to the artists and there's going to be a, a Q&A session. Okay, so uh, let's start. Uh, uh, Parsons and Charlesworth are uh, collaborative artists focusing on the objects and habits of humankind. Their inventive sculpture, sculptural practice relies upon creating objects that allow us to examine our future selves and perhaps navigate better. Utilizing sculpture, objects, narrative writing, and photography, their work addresses key social, ecological, and technological challenges of our time, including climate change, and the future of work. Recent commissions include the 17th International Architecture Exhibition, La Biennale di Venezia, and the Arsenale, and designs for different futures at the Walker Art Center and Philadelphia Museum of Art. They began collaborating in 2010 uh, after relocating to Chicago from the UK, and they both teach at the uh, School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, now, they will tell you more about their installation, but just to spend a few words on it by way of an introduction, um, they will discuss catalog for the posthuman. This is a satirical installation uh, at the Venice Architect Architecture Biennale that uses the future of work and human enhancement to draw attention to the nature of our posthuman condition. Building from the theme of the Biennale, which is how will we live together, the project asks, how will we live together if we are forced to augment ourselves to stay competitive? Drawing upon research into AI-driven working patterns, the corrosive effects of the gig economy, automation, and theories of the post-human, the project uses the setting of a trade fair to present a collection of body-related objects for workers of the near future. Um, so yes, I'm going to give the floor to you guys. Um, feel free to share your screen. And uh, now I'm just going to uh, sit here and, and listen with the rest of the audience. Floor to you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Marta. Welcome, everybody. Uh, so we're actually in Venice at the moment, where our installation is that we will talk about. Uh, we're in a very small uh, Airbnb apartment, and uh, <laughs> as luck would have it, it sounds like some construction is just <laughs> happening next door. So uh, apologies if there's the occasional bump. Uh, <laughs> But um, yes, uh, so um, we're going to talk about this, this presentation. And um, uh, but before we get into the project, uh, we'll tell you a little bit about um, our backgrounds. Maybe Jess can start while I, I share the screen. Sure, yeah. I studied, uh, I come from a three dimensional design background, which I studied uh, at undergraduate level in Manchester in the north of England. And then I had the chance to go into do a grad master's degree at the Royal College of Art in London for a course called Design Interactions. And it was run by these two professors, Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby, who were sort of mentors of ours to help introduce this idea of how can we think about design and art as a way to provoke discussion about the emerging impacts of technology in society. And I studied industrial design at undergrad and also went to the Royal College to study a master's program called Design Products. And we had separate uh, careers in teaching and design research before we moved to Chicago uh, in 2010. And a few years later, we set up our own studio. And uh, as, you, as Marta said, you know, we now uh, work as collaborative artists and designers focusing on uh, um, what we call the habits of humankind. So 
Um, you know, we use lots of different media um, to work on uh, installations that really uh, provoke uh, important questions uh, uh, from now. So um, to start off with, we're going to show you uh, a one minute infomercial that we recently made about this catalogue for the post-human project to give you a little bit of a taster. So here goes. Catalog for the post-human provides human enhancement products for today's contingent worker. We give you the tools to succeed, increasing your autonomy. With the advance of the control society, algorithmic performance metrics, digital behavior monitoring, and worker analytics, success relies upon your mind and body being fully optimized at all times. Adjust your circadian rhythms to your work schedule. Dial up the right cognitive state for your next gig, using smart drugs, safeguard your microbiome with soil-based probiotic lollipops, or absorb vitamins intravenously while you work. Analyze your data, and make it work for you. Train your personal AI, to improve your joint employability. Whatever your gig economy needs, Catalog for the Post-Human is your guide to success. Visit us online, at cftph.work. Or visit our Venice Trade Fair stand, at Hall 2, Arsenale Building, Venice Architecture Biennale 2021. Open until November 21st. So yeah, <laughs> that was our infomercial. Um, to give more of a background about how we got to this sort of world of the catalogue for the post-human, we wanted to talk about the origins um, that go back about seven years. Um, in 2014, we did a project for the Open Society Foundations, who are a grant-making organisation that promotes social justice. And they began a very huge study about technology and the future of work. And the idea was to move beyond binaries like automation taking jobs to understand the landscape in more detail. And the impetus behind the project was that new research questions had a, have arisen such as how has technology shaped not just the number of jobs but also the nature of work and in the words of the OSF um, Open Society Foundation the old question then is how precisely technology will change life for various kinds of American workers. Um, <clears throat> so we chose to focus on human enhancement technologies. In other words, technologies we use on and in the body to increase our capabilities. And we felt that these human enhancement technologies inhabit a, a kind of critical space in this debate about technology displacing work because they kind of problematize the divide between technology and people. For example, if you're wearing a headset that enables you to concentrate better or an exoskeleton that helps you lift things, your capabilities are obviously being enhanced by those technologies. And with many areas of the workforce becoming increasingly reliant on technology to gain competitive advantage, the issues are not merely about jobs being replaced by uh, technology, but the implication of people actually becoming technology in order to remain employable. So part of our research for the project was to understand the extent of the human enhancement technologies already out there. And we then extrapolated these to consider what products might appear in the near future. And then we had to decide on a format to convey this information. And some of you may remember SkyMail. Uh, it was a catalogue that used to be distributed on commercial flights. And the great thing about it was that really kind of insane product ideas were mixed in with quite reasonable ones. Uh, so it made you think, are they serious? <laughs> and uh, we wanted to borrow that format so that viewers were placed in this position of questioning what they were looking at and saying, is this really a good idea? Uh, what are the implications of this product on the people using it? So um, we created two different components for this uh, research project. There was this uh, kind of traditional research document that uh, um, brought together all of our research information about human enhancement technologies. And there was this speculative catalog of future human enhancement technology products for the workplace. And the idea of the catalogue was to produce a speculative design that could act as 
uh, a document for labor advocates and workers to use when discussing technology and the future of work. And it had this satirical tone, but the ideas behind it were obviously very serious and related to real technologies. So we, we weren't inventing technologies. It was all based on actual research. And the products were aimed at employers, employees, and uh, independent contractors or gig economy workers. So it had three sections, uh, physical augmentation, Uh, mental augmentation and also training, monitoring and data gathering. And uh, we, we don't really know exactly how uh, Open Society Foundations use the catalogue, but uh, the project really made us realise that this format of a kind of fictional catalogue of products could be very useful to anyone uh, in discussing these issues in the future. And then in 2019, uh, we got a commission to create a tangible version of the PDF that was the original catalogue for the post-human for an exhibition called Designs for Different Futures. And this was a collaboration between three institutes in the US, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Walker Art Center and the Art Institute of Chicago. And we wanted to find a way to bring these new ideas that we were, doing, we were exploring into one sort of tangible space. So we created a vending machine of sorts containing six objects and an interactive touch screen interface that would allow you to find out more about each one of these products. And rather than just making some of the objects from the catalog that we'd been working on in 2014, we decided to revisit the subject and conduct more research and create a whole range of six new products from scratch. Um, so, so this, yeah, yeah, this is a kind of, <laughs> this is an intentionally not readable slide, uh, but we're, we're using it to show that, like most design research for corporate work, there's a process of mapping and synthesis, and we try to group our findings and identify particular themes and sub themes, and uh, pull uh, you know impactful quotes and uh, really try to recognize where there's traction in terms of the ideas and issues and arguments. So we map these findings against the, the human enhancement technologies, behavioral changes and global societal changes. And this gave us a kind of master mind map for the project. And uh, most of these findings pointed towards uh, what's been called the rise of the gig economy. So things like a decrease in conventional salaried jobs, fewer benefits, restrictive contracts, and uh, the retirement age um, getting older, and increased workplace surveillance, et cetera. And from this big picture mind map, we then made a more focused map of uh, themes most relevant to the project. And um, you can see that we broke that down uh, in different ways into drivers and signals, technologies, what ifs, design ideas, implications, et cetera. And, um, but really, uh, a lot of the things that were coming out, the themes that we identified as, as being most relevant were productivity, training, health and medication, and importantly for this conference, AI collaboration, uh, surveillance and monitoring, and profile and reputation. So we conducted interviews with experts who were working uh, in the fields of human enhancement technologies and the future of work. Uh, and this provided us with some fascinating insights we were then able to take into the next stage of the project, which was generating what we call personas from which we then derived uh, ideas for objects. And these are sort of a, a technique really that we often use in our own sort of development of our ideas. And we use this idea of the persona and developed um, various different strands of our research. And we won't go through all of them, but some of them include the best sulfur, the biohacker, the AI collaborator. Um, so for example, the cognitive enhancer recognizes the variety of cognitive states required for each job and the drugs needed to get them into and out of that state. Also, the AI collaborators throws themselves into working with AI systems and trains their own AI to work as their partner, teaching it complementary skills and ironing out biases. So for each persona, as part of our own sort of development process, we, we make often these boards and collect together our own written research, notes and sketches and visual material. 
we use this material to help sort of help us put together to respond to the question, what kind of objects or services would these personas either choose to use uh, or feel compelled to be used or forced to use to stay competitive? And we edited these ideas down eventually into six final objects. Um, so yeah, a little bit. So you might be wondering, you know, how do we choose what is a catalogue for the post-human object in this context? Uh, what are the criteria we're using to determine whether an idea for an object is appropriate here? So this Venn diagram is our uh, attempt to explain that. Uh, now, th this came after the project, so uh, we weren't, we're not using this as a guide, but it's something that we've reflected on and, and sort of understood that each of, of the objects uh, really had to contain these four elements. Uh, so it had to provoke a discussion that we felt was, was relevant. Uh, it had to offer a critique of something to present an ethical dilemma or other provocation. And it had to be believable, so not too wacky or futuristic that it would be dis dis dismissed by the audience. And um, it also had to be feasible for us to make or outsource. Um, so, um, here you can see the um, the final objects that we made for the vending machine um, and we'll quickly take you through what the, they are. So this object is called the best selfer and it's a kind of life coach meets astrologist uh, which uh, gives you messages in response to your personal digital analytics allowing you to base decisions on the data sets that it's collecting. So it's collecting a whole series of, of different kinds of data and then kind of outputting them on this little screen. This is the clickbait wear, which is a line of uh, LED clothing that turns the body into a screen, enabling independent workers to monetize their appearance. And this one is called Flux AI. And it imagines a future where we work collaboratively with our own personally trained AI systems. And uh, it's a kit that uses ambiguous objects uh, to test bias in your AI's responses. So that you would put an, an ambiguous object on this little turntable and uh, that your AI system would try to recognize uh, what it was. And so this would be a means of, uh, of testing the system itself. This is the newt dial, which is about the increased use and misuse of cognitive enhancing drugs. It allows users to dial up a cognitive state and take the appropriate neurological uh, stimulants or pharmaceuticals to achieve it. And these are the mycopops, which are a range of probiotic lollipops containing a type of bacteria found in soil. And it refers to the emergent understanding of the gut as our second brain. And then this is the morning ritual, which is a set for safely microdosing LSD or psilocybin. It's a user-friendly set that would make preparation of a microdose as easy as making coffee is today. Um, so yeah, now we're going to explain the sort of for this particular product or object, we want to explain the arc of going from research to final objects. And using this piece really as a case study or as an example. And this piece came from what I mentioned earlier as the cognitive enhancer persona, someone who is wanting to manage the cognitive state in relation to each task they are doing. So the research elements behind this project were research into existing cognitive enhancement methods people already use, which revealed that microdosing, which is taking small amounts of LSD or psilocybin, was already prevalent, especially within the programming community as a means of improving mood and productivity. And our early research began with an interview with this incredible doctor, Dr. Anya Bashad from the University of Chicago, who had been doing double blind placebo tests on studies of microdosing which diff with different groups of people that revealed that people who microdosed small amounts of LSD would try a task more times than those who had not microdosed. So the cognitive abilities were not improved, but they were more open to putting increased effort and the idea of failure was sort of not holding them back. We also did research into the sort of practical sides of how microdosing actually works. And it turns out it's quite tricky and quite easy to accidentally take too much and macrodose. 
So I guess our point for this object was our critique of microdosing is that we shouldn't be doing it or considering part doing it, but that we're in a society where people may feel that they need to do it to be productive. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that's how we've moved on. Yeah, so uh, this led us to the idea of creating this kind of user-friendly kit that suggests microdosing has become as widespread as, as making coffee. And so once you, you picture an object like that, it enables people to critique that idea. So um, once this was decided upon, we worked through what the appropriate aesthetic choices might be. And for this piece, we wanted it to look a bit like a, an executive desk set, uh, hence the walnut base uh, and uh, black and gold details. And um, there's a testing beaker to make sure the LSD tab uh, is pure, uh, a dispenser for diluting it to the right strength and a cup for taking the dose itself. And it also has a pad for writing your intentions for the day, which is apparently something who uh, people who microdose uh, often do. And uh, so we modeled and prototyped this before having the final components made. Um, so here's a view of the vending machine in the designs for different features show at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And here it is at the Walker Art Center. Um, yeah. And yeah, we wanted to create a piece that didn't immediately scream vending machine. And the idea was to display one version of each object and imply through the interface that these objects could be purchased. However, when you tried to purchase one, you tended to find that they were out of stock. And uh, in October 2019, actually on the same day that we uh, um, opened the exhibition uh, in Philadelphia with the vending machine, uh, we were invited by the curators of the Venice Architecture Biennale to, res uh, to respond uh, and take part uh, in their international exhibition. So uh, as uh, Marta mentioned, so they have this theme, how will we live together? And uh, they wanted us to create this new work for an area of the exhibition uh, entitled Among Diverse Beings. So we took the opportunity to extend this catalog for the post-human project because the themes of human enhancement and the future of work uh, are obviously relevant to the idea of how we're going to live in the future. So uh, next we'd like to share a short video that we made for the Venice Biennale team partway through the project as a kind of sneak peek of what we are working on. And this shows you uh, some of the particular themes and uh, the sort of research um, elements. That this, we're yeah, at. this was from May 2020. Yes, yeah. that's right. I should say this was an image of, of the final installation. Yeah. Catalogue for the Post-Human is a satirical installation that uses the future of work and human enhancement to draw attention to the nature of our post-human condition. Building from the theme of the Biennale, the project asks how will we live together if we are alienated by our working conditions and forced to augment ourselves to stay competitive? The previous version of the project featured six objects presented in a mock vending machine at the Designs for Different Futures exhibition the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Drawing upon research into data-driven working patterns, the corrosive effects of the gig economy, automation and theories of the post-human, the project for Venice uses the setting of a trade fair to present a collection of body-related objects for workers of the near future. Under the guise of fictional retailer Catalogue for the Post-Human, we present a collection of objects that mock the contemporary capitalist need to be permanently cognitively sharp, quantifying yourself with data, and able to work the long and irregular hours assigned by algorithm-led corporations. Such potential futures suggest we will be expected to further merge with technology, physically, psychologically, and socially. What are the logical conclusions of the work-life changes we're already seeing? How will AI, brain-computer interfaces, and constant corporate surveillance impact our behavior? What are the physical and psychological consequences of giving over body and mind to the unrelenting productivity of data-driven capitalism? 
In the Venice installation, products are offered by the catalogue under four themes. Cognitive management, expedited recovery, optimised wellness and enhanced productivity. Products in the cognitive management section suggest workers of the future will be expected to use cognitive enhancing drugs to increase performance. Products for expedited recovery focus on how we might sleep efficiently and wake immediately ready for work. In optimised wellness, we find products that replenish lost fluids on the move or boost gut bacteria. Designs in the enhanced productivity section monetize the body through advertising, monitor stress levels, or reduce the need to take breaks. By encountering new products that help users cope with a society that is no longer human-centered, but is instead propelled and mediated by post-human systems, the viewer is challenged to consider how technology is being applied in this impending future. So that was a little uh, taster and we're going to take you now through uh, the six new objects that we created for specifically the Venice Architecture Biennale exhibit. So this is an image of the IV apparel, which is a wearable IV jacket that enables the wearer to take on nutrients whilst continuing to work. And it really draws upon the research that shows that contingent workers are often not given sufficient time to take proper breaks when undertaking gig work. Um, and here's a close-up of the IV bag. This is the stress watch. It's a piece about the management of stress levels, and it uses a saliva test to measure your cortisol levels. And high cortisol is a sign of stress and can obviously be dangerous. Um, but if you're not stressed at all, then perhaps the assumption is that you're not uh, being productive enough. So the stress watch enables you to monitor, monitor your stress levels and work up to, but not over, limits. So uh, exploring the tension between the need for sleep and the on-demand gig economy lifestyle, we created a range of wearable enhancements that comment on the trend in sleep technology and wellness products. So this is the REM wake. It's a wearable alarm clock that measures your rapid eye movement or REM sleep phases and wakes you up at the most alert stage of sleep. It does this in quite an intense way by releasing smelling salts made from ammonia into your nose. So smelling salts used to be used to be used to bring someone around when they had fainted and are typically used by athletes to give them a jolt of alertness. These are the sleep snackers and these pieces explore the tension between the need for sleep and the on-demand uh, gig economy lifestyle. So we created a, a range of wearable enhancements that help you to hack your circadian rhythm to realign uh, that with uh, um, the kind of economically driven cycle of, of productivity. So our core body temperature changes when we become tired or when we're ready to wake up. And in order to retrain our circadian rhythms, uh, these objects heat up and cool down particularly sensitive parts of the body where major arteries are to enable the user to wake um, or sleep in line with their work, sh work schedule. The concept here was to create these pieces that resemble sportswear and that would be worn as you sleep. The assumption being that you will potentially be sleeping at your desk or in your car and not in your bed. And uh, this headpiece, for example, have, has cushions that would allow you to kind of rest your head uh, on your shoulder to sleep. And this is the arm version, which heats and cools the inside of your elbow. And um, the kind of wide shape part um, refers to the shape of the arteries that are being heated and cooled in that area. And this is the leg version, um, which heats and cools the area behind your knees. Yeah, so to finish, um, we've got a couple of videos of the show in Venice. This is us in the high speed mode. Uh, it's a time lapse of us assembling the installation. And it's pretty much <laughs> gives you an overview of, um, sort of, I guess the impression is 
uh, you eventually see us building this trade fair stand. And we used a particular exhibition system to help sort of create the backdrop or the setting of our trade fair stand using uh, an exhibition system called Abstracto. It's a simple si system of metal tubes and connectors that allows you to make complex space frames very easily. And it just requires a mallet to assemble it. So you can sort of see us assembling the main units, adding the objects, uh, in installing the monitors, which actually have all these kind of um, notification systems that connect with each of the products. And we also worked with the lighting technicians and eventually being interviewed in the space by the Biennale's videographer. Um, and it, yeah, <laughs> I wish it was as fast as that to install and deinstall. <laughs> yes, <absolutely. laughs> I'm afraid it won't be like that. <laughs> yeah. And so to finish with, uh, this is a walkthrough of the show itself. So as you enter, there's this explanatory text. And then uh, each piece also has a marketing text written in English and Italian. And this is written in the voice of the catalog. So it's, it's like a kind of advertising text um, to give the impression you're in a commercial environment. And there's also a QR code with each piece that takes you to the project's website where you can find out more about the objects. And that website is still online. It's uh, cftph.work. Uh, so these pieces you see, the sleep snackers that we mentioned, they were definitely the most challenging pieces to make. And um, often we need to learn new skills. And uh, these pieces definitely required a lot of uh, new expertise uh, with fabrics. Uh, the, stru <laughs> the structure of that uh, headpiece in particular was quite difficult to make. Um, but yeah, each of the four areas that were mentioned in the previous video had a monitor uh, containing these animations. And this would uh, really reflect the, the kind of uh, information that you'd be getting on a smart device if you owned one of these objects. And then we used these LED uh, boards uh, to continue giving more and more um, taglines about uh, each object uh, in English and, and Italian. Yeah, in each area, there are four different areas. There's that one was called expedited recovery. And each sort of unit or each themed area is very much sort of trying to categorize the different products that are representative of that theme. And um, that's this is the Remwake piece with the smelling salts alarm clock. And that's something that we worked with by 3D printing and silicon. And uh, as we said before, these animations are sort of a Another added layer that we really wanted to include is this constant bombardment of, you know, these new um, subscriptions you might have signed up for, new products and updates you need for every time you buy, buy into a new series of wellness products or technology products. And so each time you're sort of walking from one product to another, you're sort of getting immersed through the product, the marketing texts to sort of understand you know, what is this product trying to tell me? What's it trying to sell to me? Um, and yeah, I don't know if you want to. So yeah, in. I think I think there's, uh, I mean, in relation to, to the, the subject of, of AI and the, all of those monitors with the animations uh, suggest a kind of uh, AI driven uh, sort of algorithmic management system that, that would be, constantly uh, really monitoring how much you're working, how much you're earning, what uh, your kind of uh, body uh, condition is, what, what the, uh, your kind of data analytics in relation to, to your body and your cognitive state is uh, in order for you to constantly try to optimize that. Um, so yeah, each of these uh, um, objects that we designed sort of feeds into that this kind of narrative of a, a sort of productivity culture uh, where we're expected to enhance ourselves in order to stay stay competitive and uh, I think you know it's been very interesting to see how uh, you know, people have reacted to it because obviously this is in a um, an architecture biennale uh, where uh, this is a satirical installation alongside many other installations which are not satirical. So I think some people uh, approach the objects and think that they are real, um, but hopefully if they stay long enough, they, they read uh, the text and they get more immersed 
uh, in the project itself, then uh, it kind of dawns on them that uh, this is perhaps a world that uh, is not entirely positive, um, and they start to asking the kinds of questions uh, about the ethics of technology and, and how it's used, um, and uh, that, that enables them to, uh, to have that kind of debate. Um, okay, so that's the end of the walkthrough. <laughs> And um, unfortunately, I mean, even though the show um, finished uh, yesterday, um, there's still an awful lot of information about this um, project on our website. We're also working on a kind of 3D scanned environment that we're hoping to upload and share in the future. So for those of you who weren't able to get to Venice, uh, we hope to be able to give you a, a kind of immersive uh, opportunity to uh, explore the exhibit in the future. And there is also a mini version that's installed in a small gallery in Berlin right now uh, called ReFuture Lab. Um, if anyone's based in Berlin, there's an opportunity to, to see a small installation. Yeah. So um, I mentioned our website. Um, obviously, we're on Instagram as well, and you can see a lot of the process behind the project on, on um, our Instagram. Um, and here are our contacts. And um, I think, uh, yeah, we'd love to, to take people's questions um, now. I think I'll just um, exit so you can see our faces again and stop sharing. Um, okay, we're back. Hi. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, it was very, very interesting. We have a lot of uh, questions already coming in. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would invite anyone from the audience to just uh, exactly keep on sharing their question uh, on the chat. Uh, I'm going to read them out to you. And some are also potentially similar. So I'm, I'm going to make sure to make some clustering <laughs> as, I, as I go along. But first of all, full disclosure, I was at the Biennale. And that's actually where I, when I bumped into uh, their exhibition, uh, I thought this is this is fantastic because all the rest was very serious and was very more towards the architecture side, uh, which is less of my expertise. And when I bumped into that, I thought it was very uh, very smart to be to basically have these objects being them like describing them in a very realistic way, in a very apparently serious way. And at the end of it, that was a satirical piece, and uh, it made me think a lot. So I, I did contact them, uh, full disclosure, and I. Uh, I was very happy uh, you both could make it here today. Uh, and yes, I also think I'm not too much in my personal research into the future of work, uh, but I do have a lot of colleagues working on it. And I think uh, it's a great question which you started off with thinking not just how many workers is the future, is AI, let's say, is, um, is technology going to impact, but instead, in which ways uh, and which kinds of work will it impact? Uh, and I think that's a very, very interesting question. But now enough of my comments. So first, the audience. Uh, we have a, a first question, which is, uh, which one of the products would you think would be developed actually first? And or which one would you worry or would worry you the most? Yeah, I think uh, it's it's been interesting to see which ones uh, people in the audience just kind of assumed might might already be available. And um, I mean, I, I think that there are some which obviously don't require too much of a shift, uh, either in terms of uh, the technology being currently available or the, the kind of uh, society being ready for it, you know. Um, I mean, some one of them, for example, this piece called the Newt Dial, which is it's really just a, a, a kind of fancy pill dispenser. <laughs> it uh, sort of allows you to, to turn this thing and, and select a, a kind of cognitive state. And then uh, it then gives you a, a little stack of three different sets of uh, pharmaceuticals to take. I mean, that could actually be made uh, today. Uh, um, I think we were really, I mean, the only sort of uh, barrier to that is that, that uh, this was also commenting on the misuse of um, prescription pharmaceuticals, uh, things like uh, modafinil and Ritalin, um, 
where, which are often prescribed or certain drugs that are prescribed, for example, for ADHD, you know, people taking them just in order to be able to concentrate better uh, when they need to for long periods. Um, so I think possibly some, I haven't, do you think um, some of the contents of that are sort of prescription ones as well as being um, kind of available over the counter? Yeah, there's a whole range of different ones. I do think it's all about personal choice, but also why you I think the ease of it and the acceptability of it and the expectations of others to fit into a way of working or fit into the, this idea of concentration. And, you know, I guess it questions the role of whether we we need to fit into this constant state of productivity at all times and fit into everybody else. Really, we're neurodiverse in many different ways. So I think that questions the way the way we think about 24-hour working productivity context, do we always have to fit into a, a, a time regime with everybody else? Um, I think about flexi work and I think about how people, students work. It's so, so under so much pressure. So therefore, should we reconsider the way we think about what, what expectations there are when it comes to productivity, uh, rather than having to fit in uh, and use these um enhancements um in terms of the, the <laughs> scariest one uh, reading. there's i mean the, the second part of that first question though was uh you know um which one would you worry about the most um i mean i i think that even though like the sleep the ones about sleep the objects themselves are quite benign but i think they held the idea of, of uh, sleep having to uh, fit an economic cycle rather than a, a circadian yeah. rhythm is quite worrying and it's already happening it's kind of creeping in that that we're we're forced to uh, to sleep uh, around our economic rhythms and we already yeah i think we, there's the sort of notification system hints at this idea that it's the uber of sleep really these systems the sleep snackers they tell you when to sleep in order to gain credits at the right time so if you sleep now for 20 minutes you'll increase your credit and we say credit as in this idea of an alternative system of currency uh, we hint at this idea that we already fit into a regime that we have a nap now in order to feel better later and I think that scares me the most. Sleep will never be lying down. Sleep will be very active. <laughs> and we're already in a state of mind where a lot of people are have insomnia and it, and it affects the, the anxiety of, of what they have to do as part of this kind of life that we lead. But I think that would scare me the most if napping is the new, is the napping will only ever be sleep. Uh, and we're never lying down and sort of enjoying sleep <laughs> ever yeah. again. That scares me the most. Yeah, fair enough. I, I, I totally share this. I remember the one, in fact, about the circadian rhythm instead of being in line with your economic rhythm or your productivity rhythm. And I really remember reading that and I thought, oh, it clicked. I was like, this could happen. <laughs> it's pretty, yeah. pretty scary. And it, it was, is, and it's I'm sorry. sorry. No. Yeah, and it's uh, we have two questions that are both about the perception uh, from the attendees or the audience. And I do not know whether you had a chance, in fact, to really get, and not this audience, but the Venice Biennale audience. I'm just going to read them out loud. Uh, in terms of feedback from people who attended your installation, would you know which object would likely to be the best seller? <laughs> And, and similar but different is, as you said, this object helps the observer raise question and think about these problematics. Uh, is there any topic conclusion that you obtained from the interaction with visitors which you had not thought about when producing the objects? I think I, in terms of answering the first one, uh, I think this, this microdosing set uh, called Morning Ritual was... Uh, seemed to be quite appealing. I think people who had heard about microdosing in a kind of positive light, um, uh, it's, uh, they were like, oh, is that available? You know, is that a real thing? Um, and, uh, uh, and I think perhaps the way that we designed it, 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 it looked like kind of appealing um, commercial object. Uh, but um, yeah, I think it's, it's difficult. I mean, um, I think we're, we're still receiving some feedback like through sort of social media. Or, uh, we had a chance to speak to some people and some, some press um, about it. Um, I, I, yeah, 
I mean, I think we're we're in this in a point where I think we're we're very used to working in this uh, cultural context where we we put these ideas out to the general public and. Um, I think uh, it's interesting, we occasionally hear where someone from the commercial world has come to see the exhibit and has understood it as a critique of their industry. And uh, um, so I don't think I have a kind of specific um, theme as an answer that, that's really come out uh, that I can think of. But uh, I think for us, it's made us think, oh, yeah, maybe, you know, uh, we could actually take our critique more directly uh, to the commercial world. There might be a, an opportunity to do that in the future. Yeah, I think a lot of people really are drawn into this idea that we actually already live in this situation and therefore it's not a problem. Um, and then I want to know why and how have we walked into this situation with our eyes open and <laughs> not realised how do we get into a situation where maybe these products are things that we want? I, I, I like having that conversation with people when they are going, but I want this. This is exactly what I want. And I'm like, good, but why is that? Why did we? Why do you think you need this object or product? And also these are provocations. So it's That's a right. thought experiment in and of itself. Yeah, and I think, you know, I don't want to cut into the time too much, but uh, I think in terms of your audience, I, I'm sure, you know, a lot of you are thinking about the ethics of AI in the future. And I would just say that, um, you know, consider artists and designers as part of uh, the solution to that, part of the messaging. If there are real concerns that you want to share, then I think uh, this kind of context is a great place to, um, uh, to get to those ideas and those questions in front of the public. That's true, and I really like the word provocation. It's true. I, that's that's really what it is. Even more than a critique, is really yeah. It's a prov it provokes something. I think in whatever that is for anyone who sees it. But I I really like that word. And there's a there's a question that asks, um, what kind of objects didn't make it into the exhibition that you would like to tell us about if there is? <laughs> oh sure, yeah. I mean, this is definitely a, a kind of. Uh, pretty heavy edit of, of the ideas that we had early on and I think one of the challenges that we find uh, when we're working through a project like this uh, is that you know we, we're keen to manifest things as objects as uh, and but so many of the ideas just end up going towards a, a digital outcome and you know just think oh it'd just be another app or it'd just be something on your phone and so uh, as soon as things kind of started going too far down that direction, if, if it wasn't really feasible to imagine uh, an object out of it, um, then uh, we kind of dismissed it. Um, and then the other thing was, you know, as, as part of our, our little kind of uh, Venn diagram that we showed of what is it that really makes it, you know, has to be something that is plausible and appealing. So there were, you know, we, for example, uh, at one point we were, uh, you know, we were struck by a lot of these news stories that, about um, uh, warehouse workers not having even enough time to, to go to the bathroom. So we're thinking, okay, maybe there's something uh, in that subject, but, you know, we, we worked on it for a bit. We just couldn't make anything that seemed like commercially appealing <laughs> in that area. It was also a difficult, like it was a difficult biological um, challenge to think about it. Like, how would you change or consider it as a desirable thing? But yeah, yeah, because there are ways of of um, taking things that stop you from going to the bathroom, but ultimately <laughs> they become quite dangerous. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it totally. It's a it's a fine balance, I guess. It's true. Uh, we have a uh, we have an interesting question. I think it's um, it says similar objects to the ones presented in your catalog can be used to help people with medical conditions and improve their lives. Where do you think lies the boundary between ethical and unethical use of these artifacts? That's a tough question. <laughs> Oh, it's a great question. Yeah, great. Uh, I think yeah. so many of, uh, of the things we were researching ended up being about uh, the misuse of uh, um, either technologies or uh, pharmaceuticals uh, uh, that were originally designed for, for medical purposes. And uh, I mean, we see that all the time in a way with uh, 
um, you know, this question around, uh, um, you know, the human, you know, how, what, what uh, kind of enhancement is, is appropriate, you know, um, are you ultimately taking something that uh, is, is really designed to help someone with a medical condition, but someone is misusing it to become kind of more than human or superhuman? Um, so, and I think that's, that it's a, a boundary that people draw in different places. So it, I think that is really a central part of this question about the, the ethics of uh, um, human enhancement is uh, really uh, what constitutes uh, the, an appropriate level of enhancement. I mean, we both had coffee straight away as soon as we, we got up this morning. You know, that's a, an acceptable, um, socially acceptable level of human enhancement. But, uh, you know, you push it further and further and you get to, to things which uh, are more questionable. And, and then, of course, mo most importantly, I think, is uh, really the uh, um, who has access to those enhancements. Uh, so it, it, uh, as soon as things get very expensive, it becomes, uh, um, you know, a, a real uh, sort of question of, uh, um, you know, social mobility and, and, uh, and social difference through how much wealth you have. Yeah, and I also think it's starting to change now that we're, as a human, as, as a population, we're aging a lot later and our parents are living longer and our grandparents are living longer. And you see the impacts of health on the on your family and you want to be able to help them. So you start considering what what could be, and I think about like, what if we all had exoskeletons when we got older so that we could move around and lift things and we you know, wouldn't have to worry about these kind of uh, ideas of falling and, and, and flexibility, but then that changes this high idea of should we um, make sure everyone's got this exoskeleton or should we just actually be eating healthily and being more flexible? And it just changes the way that we think about uh, what's acceptable and what isn't and what, what can we all have and what can we not have. And it's sort of, we start changing our ideas around it when it's personal and directly implicated in our own family. Yeah, and I think uh, a lot of it's about what external pressures there are. Are you being forced to do something or do you have freedom of choice to, to use it or not use it? Yeah, totally agree. And I like that this question brought up also the dimension of health, which I think uh, underlies many of these uh, art pieces. And it was for the first time when I, I saw it, uh, I saw the art installation that I thought I om it almost makes me wish uh, not to be healthy in a way that that um, that installation or that the works in the installation want you to be. Uh, so in a way, it's like you almost wish you they didn't have an effect on you and that you could actually stay <laughs> unhealthy according to their concept of health, of course, and <laughs> and, <laughs> and not follow. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and we, we have so we have five minutes left. I will. We have a question that goes more into the future. Maybe that's a good one to ask. It says, mm -hmm. um, "Beautiful work, scared me to the core." So I guess <laughs> job. <laughs> My question is, <laughs> how do you think we can steer ourselves away from the bleak technological future and steer towards a more desirable, delightful, inclusive, and sustainable future? specifically steering corporate intents and governments towards the future we would want? Yeah, I think that's a really incredible question and it's probably something that we should all be thinking about all the time. And I mean, I don't work in a corporate context, but if we could help pre-consider the implications of an emerging technology before it enters the marketplace through us designing the uh, <laughs> potential outputs, almost like role playing and testing and throwing out these ideas into a, a sort of a I guess an alternate universe to, to test out before it enters the world could you do that and help that sort of almost like a, a, a sort of a way to enter a world where people were imagining the after effects of something like this some uh, especially in health, healthcare and wellness products could that be a way of doing it that's a it's almost like a I don't know, I guess, I don't know how you describe it, this kind of um, prototyping stage, really. Yeah. I Critical think, prototyping. In the end, I, I think the, the answer to, to your question is, is ultimately to 
change the minds of the decision makers uh, in government and in corporations. And so then you get to the question, well, how do you do that? And so you, you have to find ways of impacting their decisions, uh, impacting what they learn about a particular subject and, or, and, and impacting how they, they change their minds. So I think to a certain extent, uh, public opinion on these issues um, you know, can be gathered and, and, and uh, can be expressed. Uh, and um, I mean, culture is only one way of doing that. But I think the more uh, different types of culture, whether it's art or design or film uh, or what, what have you, uh, that talks about these issues, that shows that people are concerned and um, Show is and, and that that culture can also obviously be positive as well. I mean, we happen to have ch chosen a kind of satirical angle, uh, but uh, you know, equally we could have tried to to make some very positive uh, AI of the future products. You know, um, and I'm sure there are plenty of, uh, of people working in, with that angle as well. So yeah, I think trying to make sure the debate is out there and visible and. Um, that there are uh, um, that particularly that that these decision makers are made aware that that uh, people are concerned and uh, um, that there are, there are also some you know good examples out there of what what the, the uh, positive um, direction to take is as well. Yeah, and yeah, we're still artists, so mm -hmm. we're not necessarily able to answer and solve everyone's problems through art but we can certainly try and get the conversations in the space and, and out there uh, and not shut down um, I think that's what the role of art and design can do is is have the space to have that conversation and, and not assume that it's um, not needed before these products before these systems are put in place yeah Thank you. On this closing note, which is super important, I think, especially in these times where often in technology we see that decisions are taken after, uh, sorry, before, before any conversation even takes place. Uh, this is a very, very important note on which we can end, I think. I want to thank you so much both for being here. I want to thank the audience for the questions, which uh, were very interesting. Uh, we have to close it just because we have a workshop now happening in AI ethics, which I think is an interesting continuation from... Uh, from, from yeah. Yeah. Uh, you are both welcome to stick around to explore Gather Town. The space is yours as well. Uh, so if you're curious about seeing or attending any other sessions, please, please do so. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. Yeah, great. my pleasure. Yeah, thanks really, for inviting us. Great to be here. Yeah, uh, thanks for your great uh, questions. Really thorough ones. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah it's awesome. So we can get through them all. Good luck to the rest of the conference. Yeah, yeah. good luck and thanks again. Bye. Bye. Have a good time in Venice. Thank thanks. you very much. <laughs>